Welcome to La Course on Tech, in conjunction with Peloton magazine and our tasty Belgian waffle ride friends. And as the 2021 Vuelta España enters its final decisive days, my name's OJ Borge, and we are here to discuss infernal heat, flagging form, rash descending, plucky underdogs, and most crucially, can Primoz do it again? And by that, we mean win another Grand Tour, not blow it in style. Of course we don't mean that. Hey, Paolo. Hola Aerogram subscribers, como estas? Uh, it's September and as the first mellow whiff of autumn wood smoke drifts through the mountain air, the final Grand Tour of the year is heading towards a climax in northern Spain as always to chat through it with me. The possible outcomes, the likely scenarios, the worst nightmares of this year's Vuelta are Sophie Smith from Melbourne, possibly locked down. Who knows Sophie? Definitely lockdown. <laughs> what lockdown? What lockdown is this? Six point zero, isn't it? Uh, well, I think we're about to come into seven. Well, they're about to extend six wow. again. I've sort of got to that point now. I don't know what happened on your side of the world when you guys were locked down, but I've just stopped reading the headlines now. It's too depressing. Yeah. <laughs> in a news-free world, uh, Peter Costins in the French Pyrenees, possibly locked down. I don't know, Pete. No, not locked down at all. No, we're all we're all fine, and the, the school's going back on Thursday, so that's even better. Wow, are the kids excited. Who's more excited, the kids or you, about the schools going back? My my, my daughter's got her clothes ready for th- three days hence. She can't wait to go back, and, wow. which is weird. She's like she's like Hermione from Harry Potter, I think. Wow. Okay, my kids are not excited about school going back, although they've got a few more days. And then Jeremy Whittle, who's in the Sussex <coughs> Riviera, England, wearing what? Jeremy? No, let me ask you in Spanish. Que lavas puesto hoy? That's not Spanish. Yeah, it was. <laughs> que lavas it? puesto hoy? Weirdest Spanish I've ever heard. Yeah. What are you wearing? Pantalones, mm. or whatever that is. Just pantalones, yeah. nothing else. Pan- <laughs> Sat there like a pirate. <laughs> yeah, and a un veleto had uh, <laughs> So let's. I don't know Spanish words. For I don't. don't yeah, I me. don't know. Uh, un vestimento. No, that's French. I think that's French. Anyway, let's talk about the race. Un gilet. Un gilet. Un gilet. Un gilet. That's French as well. Let's talk about a race that's heading into its final denouement. Uh, Jeremy, has it been an exciting race so far? I must admit, I was on holiday last week, so I, I missed a lot of what was happening. I caught a little bits and bobs. Has it been an exciting race in your in your expert eye? I think the first week was good. The second week was a bit anticlimactic. Partly because I think it was so hard and it was so hot and everyone was just looked like they were kind of surviving and getting through it. Uh, the most exciting thing with the second week was the rash of crashes and particularly, you know, given that the last pod we recorded about 10 hours before we did it, uh, we'd said Primoz Roglic was the most unflappable man in the history of cycling. He then went down a you know mountain and crashed. Cheers, Primoz. So, uh, yeah, apart from the crashes, I mean, it would, there were incidents, but I'd say that we're waiting for the race to really explode in these final two or three me- big mountain stages that are coming this week. Yeah, I mean, you did talk about being unflappable. It wasn't just the one crash, was it, Sophie? You had a couple of crashes, but seemed to be angered by them and rode even harder. Yeah, I think the ones I've seen, he doesn't seem to angered in the moment and then sort of just laughs it off uh, at the finish line. Some of the footage I've seen, he's had a bit of road rash, but sort of just... Um, brushed it off and said yeah everything's fine which <laughs> I think for him like bits of road rash where you and I might look at it at the, and go oh that's nasty I think for him he's sort of yeah, a bit part and parcel now so I w- wouldn't think that he's lost too much um, mentally or physically from them mm. as bad as they might have looked. So Pete with, with the the cold cool glare of hindsight is he in the most unflappable form of his life Primoz Roglic because he is the favourite for the Vuelta this year to take a third on the bounds or is he not? I think he is. I mean, it's it's funny when after he he had that crash that day, and it was on a stage where I I very unwisely predicted that nothing would happen, and it all went a bit crazy at the end. The day after that, they went to Valdepeñas de Jaén, and uh, as I did predict, he won the stage up this very steep main street, and he's basically just cruised through the race since then. He doesn't look like he's having any problems at all. His teams have looked his team have all looked pretty easy. I've been surprised by the lack of threat, really. I mean, like Jeremy mentioned, it's been very hard and it's been incredibly hard. I think that's been the key thing that lots of riders have struggled. Lots of riders have dropped out because of the heat. And even though they're up in the north now and they'll start racing again, it'd be quite different conditions on on Tuesday. And when they get into the, into the um, Pico de Europa and the Astoria Mountains on Wednesday and Thursday, that's still going to take a toll. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, it's worth pointing out we've still got three of those nine summit finishes still to go, and they're three big old stages as well. I'm going to attempt to get through an entire podcast without saying the word brutal. That's going to be my challenge to myself. Um, so how much has the heat taken out of everyone, Jeremy? Because I'm just looking at the top ten, and obviously we, we, tried to, we try to be time agnostic because of when we record these podcasts. But looking at the top ten, uh, it's odd Christian Eiking uh, of Intermarché Wanty Goubert, um, which is leading the race. 54 seconds back, it's Guillaume Martin of Kofidis. Uh, Roglic is in third, 136 down, and then it's Enric Mas, uh, Miguel Angel Lopez, both of Movistar, which are down in fourth and fifth. Is it is it weird that if we're talking about a race which is being um, which is taking place in the brutal heat of a Spanish summer, isn't it weird that we've got a Norwegian in first place? It's quite strange, isn't it? Uh, it's quite odd. <laughs> But at the same time, I'm kind of not surprised because his team has rode so hard, ridden so hard in in the second week, especially the last two or three days before the rest day. They looked like they were really flogging themselves and trying to make it almost the pace so impossible that anybody else would be really discouraged from making any moves on the jersey. And I guess uh, given how hot it has been, the others were quite happy and content to wait until the final week. And that's the problem with Grand Tours, where you have a really brutal, loaded final week with lots of mountain stages, loaded with mountain stages in a big time trial. And I think you can get this kind of waiting game in the middle of the race where, you know, the first forays have established the hierarchy. You've got rid of a couple of big names. You know, Richard Carapaz has gone home. Um, kind of, you can, you know, there's been a shuffle already. You can, you can, you, you can see who's going to be in the final shakedown. But then there's this lull where not much happens, and that kind of feels what we've had in the last few days. I pretty much agree with Jeremy. Actually, I think it's been, I mean, for me this week, the the stars have been uh, Iking and his and his Antimarche team. I think they've they've been brilliant. They've really, uh, I mean, they, they they defended him well. He's ridden strongly. Um, it did look like two or three days. Into, into him having the, the leader's red jersey that Guillaume Martin from Cofredis would, would just sort of prove too strong for him on the climbs. They, I mean, Martin's been trying and trying again to, to, to drop Iking, but he's not managed to do it. I think he's, he's clawed back like four seconds or something. But, I mean, Antomarche have, have, have ridden fantastically well, given they're probably the, uh, the lowest funded team in the World Tour. It's, it's been an astonishing effort by them. For people who aren't familiar with them, Peter, what what level are they at? I mean, budget-wise, you know, in comparison to one of the super teams, to to an Ineos maybe, because they're the best funded team. I don't know. We guess they're probably on maybe twenty percent of the budget of of Ineos. You think it's that? You think it's that little? Probably, yeah, twenty or twenty-five percent. I don't think it's very much at all. I mean, they've they've had with Antomarche coming in, who are a big French supermarket chain. They've they've had a, they've had a big boost, but. Um, I don't think it'll be much more than that. I mean, they haven't really got any star names. They've they've got Louis, Louis Meinkes, a South African climber, who's who's probably their best GC rider, who's who's kind of been on the fringe of the of the GC battle all the way through. But I mean, they're, they're basically, I mean, it, they're decent riders. They're good. They're good pros. But you wouldn't expect them to be either have a a, a, a guy in the lead or be, or be able to defend that leader. They've, they've ridden out their skins, basically. And it's brilliant. They've got that beautiful kit as well, which has got those little fluoro flourishes on. So, if, I mean, what's the chance of I King managing to hold on to this as we get to the end of the Vuelta? Holding on to it as in winning? I'm not sure. I think my money... Yeah, would... hold it. Yeah, I mean that. I mean, exactly <laughs> that. Can he do it? Are we going boys' own here? Ah... Uh... Sadly, as I know as much as I'd love a rendition of it, no, I think Roderick for me is still the favourite to win. Having said that, I don't think we can discount Iking or Martin either and, and, and just say, oh, it's the second week and um, everyone's keeping tempo. If you look at their results, like from this season, Martin especially, I think he finished, he was top 10 in the Tour de France, wasn't he? He was eight. Um, I mean, this third week is going to be some other word other than brutal that is similar to brutal. Um, <laughs> so how rehearsed they are, um, Iking and Martin, and, you know, when you've got two consecutive summit finishes and so forth, I'm not sure. I think the advantage some of the other teams have, if you go back and look at that top ten, is there's two movie star riders in there, there's two Jumbo Visma riders in there and two Ineos Grenadiers riders in there. So teamwork. Um and might also come into that as much as who has the legs and how much intermache they have after doing the work they have so far. I'm not sure. Uh, but It's worth putting it all in context, isn't it? Because we have got this time, 34, which is under 34 kilometre final time trial. 
and we can extrapolate from the first time trial, which I know was three weeks ago, and there's been a lot of racing and crashing, et cetera, and heat since then. But, you know, if you look at the time gaps in that first opening time trial from Roglic, who won the stage, to the others, I mean, odd Christian Eiking lost a minute to him. Martin, Martin lost half a minute. So, you know, that's in 7K. What's he going to do to them in 34K? Well, it's times four. I was just trying to work out that really quickly in my head, my maths not being my strong point. Um, but the problem is, though, I mean, do you think that's what... Um, do you think that's what, what Roglic is doing with Jumbo Visma? Are they holding on and saying, like, we don't have to attack, we don't have to do anything special, we don't even have to have the red jersey, the pressure's not on us as a team. We'll just hold on until that final time trouble. Because that's happened before and it's all gone wrong. Yeah, but he just has to stay in... He, I mean, this is the thing about him that that is interesting isn't it is there is there is a slight suggestion of an impulsive rider there which i think is really great for us watching as as spectators and fans that you know that there's there's a suggestion that this is a guy who's most of the time he keeps a lid on his you know impulse his impulsive nature but every now and then like he did um on the on the stage where he attacked on that final climb the stage where we thought nothing was going to happen and then it all did um and overcooks it on a bend um, it's. I'm sure his team just wants him to sit tight because from where he is at the moment, a minute and a half behind odd, odd Christian Iking, he's going to win the time trial, you'd assume, and he's going to take three or four minutes out of him and he's going to take three minutes out of Guillaume Martin and he's going to be quicker than Henrik Mass and everybody else behind him in the GC. So he's going to win the Vuelta. But that's assuming that you know, he doesn't have a wobble of some kind and that his form holds. And one of the interesting things I saw in the last couple of days was that Jack Haig was talking to a colleague of ours and uh, he said that he, he could, he'd could he sensed that uh, Roglic was fading, but I haven't really seen that. Hmm. I did see another quote, but I can't remember who said it, that was saying that they needed to have any chance with that final time trial, they needed two or three minutes on Primoz Roglic before they got into it. I think that's right. I think they, they, they do need that, but... There, I mean, there, there is a possibility they can get that. I mean, the two stages in Asturias on Wednesday and Thursday are, are both um, ridiculously hard. And then there's a stage, uh, I think, I can't remember whether it's on Friday or Saturday, in, in Galicia, which is like, a, it's been called like a mini or a, a Galician, liege Baston liege It just bounces up and down all day and then as uh, an uphill finish, I think. So, I mean, there's, there's plenty of opportunities for people there. And I, gu- I guess that kind of explains why the GC battle is kind of just kind of bubbling at the moment. Nothing's really happening. We're all, everybody's waiting. Well, the two super teams as well seem to don't have such super teams with them. I mean, Ineos Grenadiers, they've lost three riders now. Have they had three riders go home? Yes, they have, yeah. Yeah. So you've got that. And because I've seen, I've seen two states of mind on where uh, Jumbo Visma are, Sophie. Some people are saying they've not been tested, they're not at the red jersey, they've had an easy ride of it the past couple of days. And then you look at Sepp Kuss and you look at their other riders as well, and they seem to have tried to hit out for stage wins and are maybe burning matches they didn't need to. It's just a difference in a difference in racing. I always go back to, I think, with Grant, was, in my mind, everyone's sort of become quite used to an Ineos Grenadiers strategy where, <laughs> from days of old, where they just ride defensively and they're not about stage wins as long as they get that top place on the podium afterwards. I don't think Jumbo Visma necessarily ride like that all the time and I wouldn't be surprised at all if they come into this third week being aggressive even if they could just be defensive and and play it safe. I think this Vuelta especially, I mean having said that there's a lot of teams that have commented on how difficult stages have been not just not just the end of the stages that we're talking about but you know their their breaks at the start of each stage aren't going into like 80 100 kilometers into the peak so despite the heat and everything the sentiment the peloton seems to be that um (laughs) they're still going hell for leather (laughs) and maybe there's less organization in there than than we think it is but I, i imagine seeing aggressive racing this final week that's what we want. Aggressive racing over the final week. Um, now, we have three summit finishes left, and I'm going to do the pronunciation here. Everyone, hold on to your hats. Lagos de Cavadonga. Alto de la... Oh, Gamontiriu, Pete? I don't know how you'd, how you'd say it. I think it might be uh, Gamonitero. 
Well, there you go. That's better than my attempt at it. Uh, and the Healy State to Castro de Herville, although that's definitely the lesser of the trio. In reality, before the final time trial, we're saying already, you know, people need two, three minutes on top of Roglish to win it. Um, does that mean in reality rivals have to attack the two climbs left to try and crack the defending champion? Is that what needs to happen? Because you look at Bernal, you look at Adam Yates of Ineos Grenadiers, they are four and a half minutes down. On Roglic, they are, what, three minutes down. They've got to do something, haven't they? Well, Roglic is a benchmark, isn't he, for the for anyone who wants to win the race. You'd, you, you'd assume that with all the greatest respect to um, the two riders in front of him, Christian Eiking and Guillaume Martin. You'd assume that uh, they're all. He's a point of reference for for everybody else. You've got two two big, 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 brutal, some brutal, brutal, brutal summit finishes, brutal buzzers. Yo, we need like a horn sound every time somebody says the word brutal. Yeah, um, it's a bit like time agnostic as well. That's another phrase. That's yeah. Coming. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, um, so and then as you as Pete said earlier, that the age best on the age type style type stage on the final Saturday before the time trial. So it's Lagos de Covadonga and Camonitero, which are the two big finishes. And that's the, assuming it comes down to the final climb, which it normally does in Grand Tours, those are the two big opportunities for anybody who wants to hit out and try and take enough time to be able to defend the lead in the final time trial. So in reality, they've got to try and get a minute on each of those days or or do a massive, massive attack, a big, massive attack that leaves Roglic considerably further distance than just a couple of minutes, you know, like five minutes or something. And we've seen that happen to him before. We have we saw, obviously, La Planche de Belfield in the 2020 Tour. We saw that happen to him in the Dauphiné when he lost the Dauphiné. And we saw that happen to him as well in Paris-Nice um, where, you know, accidents can happen but on the way things look at the moment you'd think it's quite unlikely yeah I'd agree with that but I, th- I think I mean they've, they've got particularly in the two Astorian stages they've got a huge opportunity his his rivals I mean I've got no doubt that's what they're waiting for I mean, it's been interesting in the last few days Bernal's looked kind of a bit off the boil in the first week and just into the early part of the second week but in the last couple of days he's looked stronger and I'd expect to see a lot more of him. I mean, the, the stage on uh, Thursday, the the, the Gamoniteru, is uh, is is ridiculously hard. It's fourteen, I think it's fourteen k or fifteen k, and it averages ten percent. And it never really, I mean, it kind of fluctuates either side of that, not not massively. Um, and it's it's it finishes. I mean, it's a real, it's a neighbouring climb to the Angliru. The, the the two summits are just five kilometres apart at the top, so that gives you an idea of the the altitude they're climbing to. It's different to the Angliru because it's more consistent, but um, I mean, it's it's consistently hard. Whereas the Angliru has some easier bits on it. The Gamonitero is is just phenomenally hard, right from the bottom to the top. That's that's the key climb, I think, for his rivals. You, you know stuff is hard when you see professional bike riders who do this for a living in the form of their lives having to weave across the road to get up hills. You know then that's when it becomes a hard stage, an absolutely hard stage. I mean, that that finish is harder than, than the Covadonga climb, isn't it, Pete? Considerably harder. I would say so, yeah. I mean, Covadonga is like a classic... It, they, the classic world to climb, basically. I think they've, I don't know how many times they've had it in the last 40 years, but it's kind of there out the words. But, yeah, the Gamoni Teiru is is much, much harder than Covadonga. OK, right, I'm, exci- I'm excited for this question. OK, here we go then. Jeremy, you're now in the team car of a rival team trying to beat Roglic, heading up towards that climb. How do you approach it? What tactics do you use, do you think, to unsettle Roglic and make him lose time? I mean, looking at what you've got to do, I think Movistar are obviously in the, in the best position, although Ineos are in a similar position, but the time gaps are bigger. Uh, both teams have got um, two riders who are capable of winning the race overall um, at, at within touching distance of the of Roglic. So <laughs> with Movie Starts, Mass and Lopez, um, with Ines Grenadiers, it's Bernal and Yates. I'd have thought that really the Alec, the the chosen chosen one in both those teams in Movistar would be Enric Mass and in uh, Ineos would be Egan Bernal. So I would have thought that the obvious tactic would be to get Yates and Lopez attacking on both of those stages, or maybe not on the Covadonga because I think Covadonga suits Roglic too much, and then 
Hamanotero is going to be Gamanotero is going to be harder, uh, much harder, and also less less known, less well known by the DSs, by the riders, by everybody. So I'd have thought that's the fertile ground. But I think it's quite risky because if they get into a situation where they think, well, we've already got a podium position, do we put the house on attacking at the bottom or you know, ten k from the top of the Gamanotero, and then mass blows and and lopez is already up there and mass can't make it up to him you know there's it's fraught with risk this that's why it's i think they may have left it too late because i mean what do, what do i know i'm not a ds but i think they may have left it too late to claw back the time they need before the time trial one thing one thing i would say about enric mass is that he said uh, he said a few days ago this is the best form that he's been in since the 2018 world tour when he finished runner up to simon yates and he won the penultimate stage of that race in Andorra. I can't remember whether I think it might have been uh, Miguel Angel Lopez. He, he broke away with it at the end, actually. He got away from Yates, but Yates was so far ahead, it didn't matter. But, I mean, if he's in that kind of form, he's, it, it, you get the impression that he would his form would last right until the last last days. And that, that could mean that, that he'll, he will surprise everyone. I mean... We're talking about these two big stages in Asturias, but the Liege Baston Liege styles. I mean, we know what what classic, classic style um, profiles can can do to races. I mean, if if they race hard on those two days in Asturias and then they just go hell for leather on that on that Liege style stage, that could blow the race apart. And, it, and it's a race that probably no one's looking to at the moment. A stage that nobody's looking to, but that could be a very very interesting stage as well. Sophie, it's a question I've asked loads, this is. Listening to what Pete and Jeremy have just been saying, especially Jeremy when he talks about a podium, how much do you think, especially after the year they've had, how much do you think Ineos care about a second or a third? Do you think they, they want to go all in and, and they would bet the house rather than, you know, having a third place? I think they definitely care. They definitely care about winning. They definitely care about the podium. Would they bet the house? At this point of the race, I would say yes, actually. They've got a depleted team. It's, I don't know what the Bernal's program is or Yates' program is for the rest of the season, but we're coming toward the end of the season. They've got nothing to lose in, in betting the house now. And you know, particularly Bernal, he's, he's won the Giro. <laughs> he doesn't have anything to prove this year. Um, and Yates is, is sort of keeping his cards closer to his chest and just doing the whole we'll see. So he's not giving anything away on the second rest days about as to their outlook, supposed, apart from saying, you know, it'll come down to their legs, which is obvious um i wouldn't discount them no and I, I imagine well they'll have to race aggressively because time wise they're um they're still in the top 10 but they've as jez said they've got a bit of they're not the best place out of a super teams in that top 10 if you like and then some of the other guys like jack haig iking matan um i wouldn't discount i wouldn't discount them either and, and if not being able to hold on, then perhaps pulling out a, <laughs> a super move that might like take away from their overall chances, but it might also improve them. There you go. That was a really nice, nice way to sit the fence, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the Belgian Waffle Ride is the biggest gravel race in North America with four venues across the US. The BWR, as it's known, was created as an homage to the great one-day spring classics of Europe and is defined by long courses that are punctuated by a myriad of off-road sectors love an off-road sector. Uh, the most unique cycling event in the country, the BWR features a party-like atmosphere on and off the bike with Belgian feasting before and after. Uh, with a long day on the bike between, you can learn more about these crazy events at belgianwaffleride.bike and I demand at some point in the future to be there for waffles and riding. So if Roglic is going to ship some time, where do we think it's going to happen? Is there scope then? We've talked about ambushes and how they're going to ambushes. Similar to the one that Alberto Contador and Nairo Quintana pulled off on Team Sky and Chris Froome in the 2016 Vuelta stage to form a girl. Jeremy, where is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? Well, I I do think that, as Pete said, that that stage on the Saturday before the final time trial, the the stage that has been compared to Liege based on Liege, um, which has a series of much much smaller hills, that's more fertile territory to me than you know these mountain stages where they are, they will be relying on Roglic cracking on those big finishes at Lagos de Covadonga and Alto del Gamonitero. There's hilly stage to Castel de Aville, and that's the Saturday stage. 
to me presents a far greater opportunity for like incredibly high paced racing and just really isolating Roglic from his teammates and then maybe isolating him from the red jersey as well. But the fly in the ointment for this, for especially for Movistar, is that um, Alejandro Valverde, who's the kind of wily old fox of the of the peloton, you know, loads of experience, veteran, tactical guru, et cetera, et cetera, and the kind of team captain as well as the tactical guru of the Movistar team, he crashed out and isn't in the race anymore. So Mastin Lopez would have benefited, I would have thought, from him being there to cajole and coax. Uh, Ineos Grenadiers, I think they've been in this situation before. Um, we can think back to the 2018 Giro when um, Chris Froome seemed completely out of the reckoning and then pulled off a massive coup. Um, I loved that. I, I, I absolutely loved that because it was such a Hail Mary. It, it, well, it was a Hail Mary, yeah. but it was in Ineos or Sky style at the time. It was so meticulously planned, wasn't it? But that was Froome directed by Nico Portal and that, that was a different era for this team. So... <clears throat> will Bernal and Yates have the same wherewithal and the same insight? I mean, they've done that before. So All the same strength to do something like that. Yes, yeah. But so, so they, they, the team itself has been in a, a, a situation where they've, where they've had to do that kind of thing in the past. Um, so whether they, there's great learnings from that. Movistar, I mean, I'd love Enric Mass to win the Vuelta because I remember, um, which stage was it earlier this year where he had a puncture in the final kilometre of that time trial. Was that the tour of Valencia? I think it might have been, yeah. And do you remember he was going to win Stefan Kung one, didn't, didn't he? And he threw, um, there was some nice, nice. he had a big fit, yeah, a big hissy fit at the finish line and threw his helmet around and kicked, kicked the uh, bump of the team car. Don't think, it had, don't think that probably did much for his foot, but anyway. Um, so, you know, I, and he's a great rider, as we've said before. He's really classy and, the, you know, he's in the ideal terrain for him, big mountain climbs. So him winning would be fantastic uh, because Spain needs a big new champion as well, I think. But I think it's probably more down to Ineos, isn't it, do we think, to, like, pull off a coup? Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean... It... We heard uh, Dave Brailsford talking after uh, after they won the Giro last year, after Teo Gegenhart won the Giro, about this kind of uh, flamboyant, swashbuckling racing style that uh, that they were going to bring in and kind of letting everybody race and not really looking at their power meters all the time and, and just being a bit more free about everything. And we've seen we've seen evidence of that. I mean, it, it has happened, but we haven't really seen much evidence of it uh, so far in the Grand Tour. We saw some of it from Bernal, but I mean, Bernal was the strongest rider at the Giro and, and quite rightly won that. He didn't really need to be massively swashbuckling. Now now they just need to throw everything at Roglic. I don't think... Um, I mean, Bernal's got nothing to lose by doing so. I mean, I think it, if he finishes second or ninth, it probably doesn't make a massive amount of difference to him because he's come here to win. He wants to have all three Grand Tours on his Palmares... So he's he's got to find a way to win, and um, maybe Adam Yates would, wouldn't mind a second or a third place because he's not finished on the podium of a, of, a, of a Grand Tour before. But I think Bernal's the the guy they they've got to look to, and he's just if his form is coming, then uh, he's the one I think Rod, Roglic has got to be most aware of. I'd like I'm interested to see how they play that out though. During the rest day, if you look at the interviews with Yates and Bernal, Yates especially was being quite defensive in his comments and saying that it was ridiculous that people kept looking at Ineos for, as the team that should be doing something on the road and was almost questioning why people would think that would be the case. I almost think with them they'd be, but they'd be better to sit back when they and let some of the other teams do some of the work, which is not what they've done for the entire Vuelta. But, um, yeah. I would have thought maybe trying a different a different tact in uh, almost like anti what what Brailsford has said that they're going to do all all season and they I agree with Pete they haven't they haven't really done that but I've would imagine no that it would be better for them to like they've got less numbers they're not you know as well placed as movie stars is, is at the moment I would have thought they'd sat sat back a bit and just let other people burn matches and then do something later on. Do we think, though, that Egan Bernal in this Vuelta has been a disappointment? Whoa, that depends on whether you think he is keeping his powder dry or not. What does everyone think? Because I I'm, I'm, I don't think he's got the legs for it. Um, and, you know, that I'm prepared to 
to crash and burn on that. I may well crash and burn on it. But he's looked too often like he's... I mean, he's been closing gaps quite a lot um, on climbs when accelerations have gone. He's not, be, he's not been able to respond immediately. Small gaps, but gaps nonetheless. And he still doesn't look like the rider that he once was. Um, is that everybody else's sense? I th- think you're right, but I just had the sense on the last couple of stages, and the, particularly on uh, Saturday's stage to the P- Pico de V Vergas, that uh, Roman Bardet won. Um, he was he was a bit stronger that day. Well, he looked he looked stronger compared to some of the other GC guys. He looked strong compared to to Adam Yates, for example. And I don't know. I mean, like OJ says, maybe he's keeping his powder dry. I mean, he, there's 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 keeping your powder dry and then falling too far back in the GC race, which I mean, he is a long way back, but. He can easily make that time up in the last week. I mean, we, we, we talked about ambushes before, and you think back to Alberto Contador at, at Fuente Day in, in 2014. It is possible at the Vuelta to do these 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 mad things because by this by this point, everybody's kind of running on fumes. It's been incredibly hot, and crazy things can happen. That's what the, that's what happens in the last week, week of the Vuelta. The other thing is that Bernal didn't come into the Vuelta, did he? as a designated leader. I mean, Brailsford at the start of the season, like in January, said, no, no, we're riding for Yates at the Vuelta. So I wonder if Bernal's almost been given a bit of free reign to see how he feels <laughs> almost <laughs> and then make his own mind up in the third week. I mean, he's the guy that you would expect, as I said earlier, is the chosen one of those two, of, of him and Yates. And as you pointed out as well, Pete, he, 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 Yates will probably be happy with the podium finish. Uh, Bernal is here to win and to win a to win to add his uh his grand tour hall as well so so for me he's the guy who they'll be looking to but at the same time as i say i i I, it has he already been at his best in this race or is the best yet to come obviously we don't know no we don't i guess that's because we're time agnostic on what has been a brutal to voter so far to get them all in at the same time. <laughs> What's been your favourite ambush in the course of your racing history, do you think, of all the races you've watched, Jeremy? What has been your favourite ambush? Oh, blimey. I mean, there's been some in smaller races that have always been quite good. I'm trying to think back to kind of Paris-Nice and races like that. But I think, I mean, I think the legend, the, the, the most extraordinary and remarkable one would be the Froome one in the Giro on the Colla della Finestra because that's such a spectacular stretch of road. You know, it's gravel. Uh, he was on his own. Um, How long was he out for? It was a hundred k, wasn't it? I can't remember the exact distance. It was, it yeah, it was kind of really remarkable, and I think it was a total throwback to kind of something that Charlie Gaul or Gino Bartoli or Fausto Coppi would have done in the Giro, like you know, fifty years ago or something, or even even longer than that. So I think I think they even I think the Giro even did something like they sepia tinted the footage when they did that like that like their highlight show reel because you know it had this kind of. Uh, nostalgic kind of appeal, um, but at the same time, of course, that's that's kind of something that oh, you can't imagine anyone else ever doing that in the modern era, really. Um, so I don't. Uh, maybe maybe Alberto Contador, as Pete was saying, is was the same kind of rider who would just you know throw the kitchen sink at the thing and see see if it worked, and you know a few times for him it did work. So I guess a good place to end here would be to look at our favourite underdogs. We do have a man who's wearing the red of the leader of the Vuelta right now, Odd Christian Eiking of the Intermarché Wanty Goubert team, who is an underdog, however much we're excited about him being the leader of this race, and he is when we record this. Um, who have been your other favourite underdogs through the course of cycling? Because cycling loves an underdog, Pete. Every sport loves an underdog, there's no, no doubt about that. I mean, you, everybody loves the un- unpredictable I mean, of the ones that uh, that I can remember, I suppose the most, perhaps the most famous at the tour is is Thomas Verkler at the two thousand and eleven tour, and Verkler, I mean, and we've seen we've seen this with with Iking as well. Verkler was was just kind of, just kind of pulled inspiration from the jersey that that he was wearing, and just it, it kind of forced him on. I mean, he came undone by it in the end because he he was pulling so much inspiration. He actually thought he could outrace Alberto Contador at the Galibier and uh, that proved the undoing of him but um, I mean it, it could be that I mean iking has been swinging towards the back of the group on some of the climbs but it doesn't look like he's 
been in massively serious trouble yet. Maybe, maybe he can hang on. Maybe he can hang on to a podium place. It'd be an astonishing result. Maybe we're seeing a new Grand Tour rider, somebody who's discovering himself and thinking, well, actually, I always thought it was pretty good. And, and yeah, this proves it. My, I've got a good story about Thomas Verkler because he nearly peed by beside your car, Pete, during the Tour de France this year. Did you know that? And I stopped him. I stopped him. No, because he was. We 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 turned up at the start village one morning, the final week, and he was he was wandering he was wandering around, going oh je dois pipi je dois pipi, and I I said don't not there because that's because that's my colleague's car. It's pee police. <laughs> and, he said, and he went oh sorry sorry sorry, and he said there's so many people around. And I said yeah it's the start village. <laughs> Did you point him towards maybe a journalist you didn't like? I said there's a big tree over there. Yeah, go over towards that Australian's car over there. Go wee on that. Tommy, go and go and gurn over there. <laughs> go and pull your faces over there. Who's been your favourite underdog, Sophie? I don't know if I have one. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Sophie doesn't. Sophie doesn't work in the world of underdogs. Sophie doesn't do underdogs. No. <laughs> no, yeah. big dogs or no dogs. That's where Sophie comes from. What about you, Jeremy? Who's your favourite underdog? Well, I think I think I I kind of have a little bit of a soft spot for Claudia. Claudio Chiapucci back Chiapucci back in the 1990 tour, which is when he first emerged, and he um, got into this breakaway at the start of the tour, and everyone was kind of mocking him and stuff, and he took I can't remember how much time, but it was a lot of time, and then he held on to the other jersey for ages and ages and ages, and then nearly won the race until Greg LeMond came through and caned everybody. Well, didn't cane everybody, but won won enough time back in the final time trial. So wonderbar. Right then, let's end with the podium predictions. Let's encase them in stone. I don't normally like to do a podium, but Jeremy has strong armed me this time. So he can start. Jeremy, give us your podium. By the time we next reconvene for our final Vuelta podcast, where will we be at? Who'll be where? Okay. Roglic, Mass, Haig. Oh, oh. Interesting. Okay, Sophie. Because now I'm gonna look like a bad Australian. I'm gonna say Roglic, Mass and Martin. Okay. And Pete? I'm going to say Mass Roglic Bernal. I'm going to say, because as we said before, I'm a romantic at heart, I King, Martin, Roglic. It's going to stay as it is. The top three <laughs> as they are, I King's going to hold on. No change. The biggest mountains in Spain, but no change. No change whatsoever. Or maybe Mikel Lander will jump up from oh, 29, no. 48 minutes down. Because he was my tip. What happened, Pete, to Mikel Lander? What happened? We 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 shouldn't we should never tip him, OJ. No. I think it's just come down to that. Just just ignore him. <laughs> just ignore him. <laughs> ignore Lander. He might do something amazing. Uh, well, thank you very much to Jeremy, to Sophie, and to Pete as well. Many thanks as well to our sponsors, the Tasty. I don't know why I keep calling them Tasty. That's because it's waffles. Uh, our sponsors, the Belgian Waffle Ride. We'll be back when the dust has settled to rake through the burning embers of the 2021 Velta, the final Grand Tour of this season. Thank you for listening. Check out LaCourseOnTech.com for more writing and the Peloton socials as well for all the stuff that goes on. Until then, au revoir. I know that's French. Until then, adios. Via, via. Vieni via di qui, niente più ti lega a questi luoghi, neanche questi fiori azzurri.